So I just wanted to say full disclosure that I am in no way, shape, or form um, a lymphedema specialist. As you heard, uh, you know, my area is um, integrative medicine. I'm a clinician in internal medicine at the Beth Israel Deaconess and a clinical researcher in integrative medicine and mind-body um, exercise. And so I hope that this, uh, what I prepared for you today, will offer you a, um, a new and helpful perspective uh, in the care of your patients. All right. So it's a little bit of a gear shift here. All right. So first of all, I think it's important to understand what exactly are we talking about when we say integrative medicine. There have been many terms to describe integrative medicine, like complementary uh, medicine, holistic medicine, traditional medicine. And sometimes these terms um, tend to take sides or you know, seem to pit one against the other, like alternative medicine versus conventional medicine. But more recently, the definitions have been much more collaborative in nature. Um, so essentially, to me, integrative medicine involves bringing together conventional and complementary approaches in a coordinated way that reaffirms the relationship between the practitioner and the patient and often emphasizes self-care and the multidimensional whole person. This is a schematic that gives a sense of the breadth of integrative medicine. These are practices that are often considered complementary or integrative therapies. It's an older classification, uh, but it illustrates some of the heterogeneity of the field here. So from you know, biologically based by mouth things, diets, herbs, natural products, supplements, to manipulative and body-based therapies like massage or chiropractic, uh, to mind-body medicine like meditative movements like yoga, tai chi, um, et cetera. Uh, and it's also important to note that there is a very wide spectrum of level of evidence available for many of these diverse therapies. So ranging from very good, rigorous, uh, randomized control trials for, uh, for example, for acupuncture or for mind-body therapies um, to relatively less data, for example, for Reiki or for homeopathy. There is a National Institutes of Health Center devoted to the research in integrative medicine. Uh, it started in 1991, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. The most recent fiscal budget was greater than $145 million dollars um, for research in this area. And, and most recently, the center has prioritized mind-body practices and, and natural products um, research for their por portfolio. And if you're interested, I would really encourage you to take a look at this website. Um, it provides some very good information on the field in general, the research that's being done. It also has some good patient info, fact sheets, and evidence on various therapies, uh, as well as a new mobile app uh, that they created with information on common herbs. So the integrated medicine field is a growing field with uh, strong academic initiatives in research, education, clinical work, as well as health policy. Uh, the, this is the landing page of the website of the Academic Consortium for Integrated Medicine and Health. It's the major academic organization of the field with over 70 member institutions and medical centers such as Harvard Medical School, UCSF, Vanderbilt, uh, Duke, et cetera. This is prevalence data from the National Health Interview Survey. This is one of the oldest door-to-door -door nationally representative surveys done annually uh, since 1957 for, uh, by the D National Center for Health Statistics. It gives just a snapshot of the health of Americans each year. And every uh, few years since 2002, they have uh, added questions on the use of integrative therapies. And the most recent information we have is from 2012. So more than uh, one third of American adults are using some form of integrative therapy. Uh, natural products and mind-body therapies are among the most prevalent. And out-of-pocket expenditures are about $30 billion per year. So what about integrative therapies for specifically lymphedema? Well, you might not be surprised to hear that um, if we want to speak specifically about lymphedema, there's a relatively small body of evidence uh, available to look at. And almost 100% of this evidence is around breast cancer-related lymphedema. So I'm going to spend sort of the rest of my time talking through some of this literature with you. We think that lymphedema patients are using integrative therapies. This was a um, you know, small cross-sectional survey. It was a male survey to members of the Lymphedema Association of Queensland in Australia. And their members were lymphedema patients following uh, mostly breast and GYN cancers. 
And in the last 12 months, half reported using some form of integrative therapy, and most were also using mainstream therapy. So really, the point is that they were using these therapies in conjunction with and not instead of their conventional management. Uh, over 27 types of integrative therapies were reported, and among these, the most common were yoga and meditation, and they also uh, were perceived to be effective. So a few years ago, a couple years ago, uh, the, the Society of Integrative Oncology put together a task force to look at the literature between 1990 and 2015 behind integrative therapies during and after breast cancer uh, treatment, uh, including for su symptoms such as lymphedema. Um, and the clinical guidelines were subsequently endorsed by the American Society for Clinical Oncology. And you may be familiar with the ABC grading system where depending on the level of evidence, a treatment may get a grade A if there's high certainty for a large benefit, grade B, high certainty for a moderate benefit, um, and grade C, moderate certainty for a small benefit, and there's also D&E if there's evidence for either no benefit or for harm. And the punchline here is that specifically for lymphedema, uh, the report just named laser treatment and manual lymphatic drainage as grade C recommendations. And one might actually argue that these are not usually considered in the realm of um, integrative medicine. So I'm actually not going to be talking about these therapies. And I know that you've already had some um, talks a little bit earlier about, about this. And probably most of you in the audience know much more about these therapies than I, particularly manual lymphatic drainage, because um, I think it's, for some, you know, considered some standard treatment. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is... Um, talk about a few other integrative therapies that may have had insufficient evidence for the clinical recommendations, but that there is a developing body of literature that's promising and may be worth consideration. So I'm really going to focus on the first two here, acupuncture and yoga, uh, in the interest of time. So the first, acupuncture. So acupuncture is a practice that's rooted in traditional Chinese medicine. It's a technique where practitioners stimulate specific points in the body, most often by inserting these thin needles through the skin. Uh, it's based on a system of channels and meridians connecting these acupoints. In terms of safety, it's generally considered safe when performed by an experienced, well-trained practitioner using sterile needles. And there's actually a pretty good body of uh, literature, extensive studies regarding efficacy, especially for acute and chronic pain conditions uh, for example, back and neck pain, osteoarthritis, knee pain, headaches, et cetera. Specifically, acupuncture for lymphedema, there are a handful of studies. So several single-arm pilots, a couple of RCTs, again, promising but very small samples. All right. So this is one of those studies. This is a study that was done at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute um, by Barry Kasselitz's group. It was a single-arm pilot of 37 women with, clinically uh, cl with a clinical diagnosis of breast cancer-related lymphedema for six months to five years. They uh, underwent acupuncture twice a week for four weeks. And they reported a decreased arm circumference. So just to orient you here a little bit, the x-axis is uh, pre-acupuncture circumference arm circumference in centimeters. The y-axis is post-acupuncture circumference uh, in centimeters. The dashed line indicates no change uh, over time. The dots are individual cases. So the dots below the line are showing a decrease in arm circumference from pre to post-acupuncture uh, pre post across all severities of lymphedema. Uh, so 55% of the patients experienced a 20 to 30% reduction in their extent of lymphedema and 33% experienced a greater than 30% reduction. There were a few reports of mild bruising and minor pain or tingling, but no serious adverse events, infections, exacerbations after the 255 total treatment sessions in this study. So sometimes early on in the study of an intervention, uh, qualitative work is important to better understand what's going on at the level of the individual patient experience and to generate, uh, generate new hypo hypotheses. So this was a focus group study uh, nested in an observational mixed method study of 27 patients with breast, head, or neck cancers and subsequent lymphedema who underwent acupuncture treatment. And the aim was really to better understand the perception of the patients, 
the experience of the acupuncture sessions and the effects of acupuncture on well-being. So while the study clearly stated that acupuncture was not intended to treat the actual lymphedema itself, many reported improvements in lymphedema-related symptoms. So in this figure, um, acupuncture led to a reduced symptom burden, such as the reduced sensations of heaviness, uh, pain in the arm, discomfort, um, de a decrease in the arm swelling, a perceived decrease in the arm swelling, um, and some increased mobility. And acupuncture was also associated with increased energy, leading to an improved motivation, self-management, and well-being, uh, with each of these sort of feeding back on itself, on itself. So not all studies, though, have been positive with respect to arm circumference. This is another study that was done at the Memorial Sloan Kettering with patients with breast cancer-related lymphedema. Uh, this was an RCT with 82 patients. They underwent uh, acupuncture twice a week for six weeks versus a weightless control. And they did not see significant differences in uh, arm circumference or bioimpedance, which is the measure of extracellular fluid. Um, but they also did not uh, have any severe adverse events. So this is the uh, clinical decision-making two-by-two safety efficacy table that I think is really useful when you think about con or considering you know, integrative therapies or integrative medicine or really any therapy. Um, on the x-axis, we have increasing efficacy. Uh, on the y-axis is increasing safety. And, um, you know, when therapies fall within, you know, the upper right here, it's kind of a no-brainer where there's evidence that it's safe and there's also evidence that it's efficacious, then we would, we would recommend this particular therapy. Um, similarly, if you're down here on the lower left, then um, it's also a no-brainer. If it's not efficacious and has risk or harm, then you don't uh, recommend, avoid, and discourage. But it's when you fall into these other two um, boxes that it's, it's more interesting. And particularly here in the upper left, um, where there is evidence for safety, but uh, the evidence for efficacy may be as of yet inconclusive. So it may be at these, this particular instance where you might consider uh, a particular therapy for a patient or tolerate its use if the patient really wants to try it, um, and then closely monitor. So I also wanted to mention just a few ongoing acupuncture studies. Uh, the, this, the top one is a larger scale uh, multi-center randomized control trial that's, that's being done in China right now uh, with 200 breast cancer related uh, lymphedema patients. And this is acupuncture versus sham acupuncture with the Streitberger needle, which is a very interesting uh, invention that's only used in acupuncture studies. It's a, it's a needle that for all intents and purposes, when you uh, look at it, um, observe the treatment. It looks like the needle is going into the skin. However, the, the needle actually retracts up into the uh, shaft of the needle, and so it doesn't actually pierce the skin. And they're looking at limb volume as well as uh, quality of life and, um, and, and safety. And we should have some data on this, uh, on this trial in about a year's time. And then I also wanted to mention Dr. Singal's uh, study here at the BIDMC. It's a small pilot of 21 patients, acupuncture versus a weightless control. This is also in breast cancer-related lymphedema patients. And uh, he's looking at some uh, state-of-the-art measurements that they're doing in their lab. So in addition to the bioimpedance spectroscopy as well as circumference and quality of life, they're also looking at the durometry, the skin turgor, um, pyrometry, which um, I understand is a more sensitive volume measure by infrared optoelectronics. Um, as well as looking at inflammatory cytokines. So the mechanism for acupuncture in lymphedema is really not well described or understood. However, the hypothesis in Dr. Singel's uh, study here is that there is a role for modulation of systemic inflammation. Okay, so moving along, um, talk about, a little bit about yoga. So yoga, it's an ancient and complex practice that's rooted in Indian philosophy. It originated several thousand years ago. Yoga began as a spiritual practice, but really has become popular as a way of promoting physical and mental well-being. Yoga practice in the United States typically emphasizes physical postures called asanas, breathing techniques called pranayama, and meditation, dhyana. And popular yoga, yoga styles such as Iyengar, Vinyasa, 
and Hatha yoga focus on these particular elements. So possible purported mechanisms of um, yoga and, and lymphedema include the movements coordinated with diaphragmatic breathing, simulation of the autonomic nervous system, and increasing venous and lymphatic circulation, um, as well as increases in flexibility, muscle strength, and range of motion. This is a small pilot RCT with breast cancer survivors with stage one unilateral lymphedema, and these patients were randomized to eight weeks of yoga versus usual care, uh, and that included self-care, compression sleeve, self-massage, skin protection, and other usual lymphatic treatments. Um, and at eight weeks, the investigators <clears throat> reported a decrease in induration in the affected arm in the yoga group by tonometry and improved quality of life. There was, however, no change in objective arm volume or extracellular fluid. And this particular investigator group is planning another larger study uh, this year. Another uh, well done, albeit very small, uh, single arm pilot done at UCSF was uh, this study in 21 patients, uh, status post surgical treatment for breast cancer, who were at high risk for breast cancer related lymphedema. So those who had a, sent a sentinel lymph node dissection with five or more lymph nodes removed, um, an axillary lymph node dissection or axillary uh, XRT. And so this particular study reported that yoga was safe and feasible and may actually improve arm um, and shoulder uh, range of motion, shoulder flexion, external rotation, as well as strength in the effect, on the affected side, shoulder abduction, grip strength, and elbow flexion. Um, there was, however, no change in volume of the at-risk arm, but also no safety concerns. Okay. So we can't really talk about integrative medicine again without coming back to that whole dimensional, whole multidimensional person. Uh, so this was another qualitative study uh, in lymphedema patients after eight weeks of yoga. So one of the key components of most mind-body therapies like yoga is a cultivation of self-awareness, body awareness. So these were common themes that came up uh, in, in these patients in the qualitative interviews. So patients, un, uh, patients spoke about becoming more aware and, um, and understanding their arm morbidity. So not just the physical sensation and the pain and the achiness, but the sensation or the sense that, that there was some abnormality there or that the arm was somehow disconnected from the rest of the body. Um, they talked about awareness and understanding of, of having lost something, of a loss, not just a loss of a body part, but loss of, um, of a functional uh, ability, a loss of ability to, to garden and do everyday things, and loss of a social role, loss of the ability to be, um, be grandma or do the things that grandma used to do. You know, and, and this was very important to the overall experience of these patients. They talked about awareness of their posture uh, and awareness of kinesiophobia, a fear of movement, and how, how the yoga helped to improve that kinesiophobia, improve the movement and the posture. And this was linked to uh, self-efficacy and increasing their self-confidence. They talked about yoga countering fatigue, uh, better sleep, relaxation, how yoga was energizing, and it improved not just physical, but also emotional vitality. And they also talked about, again, this enhanced embodiment, this whole, this, uh, this concept of the whole body, the multidimensional uh, person, uh, where, where not just physical, but emotional and social aspects um, of, of their whole being um, affects their perception of their illness. And, um, and really how this new awareness and understanding led to these therapeutic benefits. So this is a very familiar, I'm sure, biopsychosocial model. Um, and when you think about the patient with lymphedema sort of in the middle, there really are a host of other physical, psychological, emotional, contextual factors that affect the patient experience. You know, so not just you know, their compromised physical function, decreased strength, fatigue, pain, but how this uh, affects their self-confidence, uh, their distorted body image, negative emotions, their anxiety, frustration, sadness, anger, fear, and how this is overlaid by the social context and the social background, culture, altered social roles, changes in family life, peer interactions, changes at work and school. 
So when you consider this model, there may be a real role for some of these integrative therapies that may be beneficial in these realms. So if we go back to the Society of Integrative Oncology Clinical Recommendations, while we said before that specifically for lymphedema, the guidelines were pretty conservative and didn't give us much in the way of specifically treating lymphedema, um, there are actually many grade A, B, or C recommendations for related symptoms that are very relevant uh, to patients with lymphedema. For example, uh, meditation, music therapy, stress management, um, yoga, massage, for things like anxiety, stress reduction, depression, mood, quality of life, um, and physical function. So, in summary, uh, these are the key points, if you remember nothing else, really. Firstly, I wanted to make the point that integrative medicine really combines you know, evidence-informed complementary and conventional approaches together, and often, again, focuses on that multidimensional whole person. Second point is that there is a developing literature on acupuncture and yoga for patients with lymphedema, and especially for cancer-related lymphedema and arm edema. Um, and within this, acupuncture and yoga may be relatively safe, you know, in patients with lymphedema. Uh, in terms of efficacy, there are some small studies that show some promise, but of course, it, this is quite early on, and further studies are needed, and these efficacy studies are ongoing. But if you think about, again, that two-by-two two safety efficacy table, uh, there may be instances where um, you might consider one of these therapies uh, for, your, for your patients. And then lastly, there is substantial evidence for many other mind-body therapies uh, for other relevant symptoms in patients with lymphedema, such as for pain, fatigue, sleep, anxiety, depression, fear of illness, uncertainty, uh, and quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you.